Awesome. So, uh, Josh, super excited that you're able to come hang out and talk coaching with me. Um, yeah, man, let's just dive right in. I know you have a young mm -hmm. club, right? You started your school not too long ago, September. So we're one, what? Seven, yeah, I think that's five. Just about right? five. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Matt. But man, so that's really interesting because I think from day one, you just hit the ground running with like mm -hmm. eco and trying to have very live resistance be like a core tenant. Oh yeah, for room. sure. What? What, what question? Because I'm just curious. Did you know you wanted to do that? Like, was that something you were already doing in like your previous coaching experience, or were you like, man, now that I have a fresh slate, I want to kick it off? No, I've been um, all in for. So I've been coaching about two and a half years, uh, full time coaching. And when I first started coaching, I started with eco stuff, um, but I didn't really. Like I didn't have a framework to sort of hang it on. Uh, so I was reading like the papers because I worked at a university at the time. And we started during Thanksgiving break, essentially, uh, was when I started coaching. So I didn't have students there. So I was just like reading the research on skill acquisition. And that was how I came across uh, ecological psychology and ecological dynamics. And I just thought it made a lot of intuitive sense. I thought it was really cool. So I was trying to use it, but I just... The uncertainty was beating me. Um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, the people I was coaching, that they were um, improving. And I had this, the traditional approach, which I knew that people had used who were world champions, right? But I didn't know about this. And so the uncertainty beat me. And so after about two months of trying it, I went back to drilling, situational sparring, using the moves that we drilled. And then it, it was like maybe a month later or something like that, uh, DeAndre Corby, Gavin Corby, and Alex Wynn all won gold in adult no-gi pans. And then I saw an interview with Greg where he was talking about, yeah, we don't do technique. You know, he was hitting the, the highlights, the headlines for that. And so uh, I jumped back in after that. And then I think I saw one practice of his. And it sort of gave me a framework to use in like identifying invariants and structuring practice around that um, and sort of jump back in from there. So fully for most of the time that I've been coaching. The uncertainty and feeling like, ah, should I switch? Most people what was sort of like, what made you think that? Because you, you, you did yeah, switch for, sure. for a bit, right? And then, yes, walk me through like what made you feel uncertain? Like what were those doubts or all right. So one, I, I cared a lot about my students actually getting better. Um, so I wanted to give them what was best. I, I hadn't heard of anybody using this approach at the time. So I didn't have like um, the analogy I use is like the, the, the four minute mile. You know, nobody could run it. Then one person ran it and then everybody starts doing it. Um, so there's like this belief that it can be done using that method. And um, I didn't quite know how to apply um, not teaching technique, creating situations for people to learn in. Um, so what I tried to do basically was I would take like a John Donaher instructional and just take aspects of it and try to create games around that. But what it created was like this sort of hybrid where I was like kind of telling them techniques like, here's what we do. This is what the move that you're trying to do. And like, I knew it, it didn't feel right to me. There was just an intuitive sense that I wasn't doing something right. It felt very similar to what I was already doing with just drilling moves and doing a lot of situational sparring where we would try to hit those moves. And then at the same time, you know, I was a big Andrew, still am a big Andrew Wiltsey fan. I love watching him roll. And he, he talks a ton about drilling. You know, drilling is so important. And so I've got like that in my ear as well. And so it was like a mixture of not being confident and not understanding fully how to apply the literature to practice and having someone who I really looked up to um, in the jiu-jitsu scene preach the opposite of what I was trying to do. And so I kind of went back until, honestly, until I saw 
Greg and them do it. And so that gave me the confidence, okay, it can be done. And then I, I still needed a sort of framework. Uh, I can't remember which podcast of, or conversation you had. You had it with somebody where th- y'all were saying there should be, I think it might have been pre, there should be a template uh, for coaches to apply this. I kind of needed something like that. And uh, I think it was like one of Greg's Instagram videos about like, uh, I don't even remember what the situation was, but that gave me a framework. So it was that, having voices telling me it was wrong, feeling like it wasn't right on my own sort of intuitive sense, and then um, not having like a template to sort of get me started and get the wheels in motion. One of the most common things I hear is the like spearhead practice myself. What I always am curious about is like, did you feel like just seeing like an Instagram reel of like, yo, here are three triangle games or whatever was enough or did you need more than that because like for me i saw Mm -hmm. like okay got it i can like deconstruct it i see what's happening here and like run with it but i know for like a lot of people that's either not enough for maybe it's like a confidence thing or whatever but like what made that feel like enough for you oh yeah that was plenty for me um so around that same time a, a thing i started doing started doing sort of in conjunction with like watching that it was just one clip. It might have been the triangle practice. I don't know. But I started watching a lot of matches and trying to see, okay, what's really happening in every time? Like every competition. What are these people fighting over? And the first sort of thought I had was it's all about hips and shoulders. Everything is about hips and shoulders. So I started doing that process of whittling it down into like the most bare sort of concept that that's present. You know, and Greg would call that an invariant. Um, And then in his games, they were all around sort of invariant features. So I saw how he used invariants in this situation. And so I just started trying to identify the invariants in other situations. And then on top of that, I had to break it down to like, what are the common situations? Um, So it was like uh, chest to back pinning, chest to chest pinning. Seated guard versus standing opponent, seated guard versus kneeling, and then um, supine versus kneeling, supine versus standing. Those were kind of the ideas, belly up, that sort of thing. And so then I would just, I started by creating practices in each of those situations, and then we alternated each day to where we didn't do the same practice consecutively. So I had crazy variability for probably the first six months. So I had like seven practices that I just rotated through for six months. And then just through trying that, I could kind of trial and error, see, okay, this has a really good effect. Okay, this didn't have the kind of effect I thought it would. And so just those six months with those seven practices, tinkering and tailoring, got me to a point where I felt like I was actually pretty um, stable as an eco coach finite set of practices you know and getting like that frequency uh what did like those individual blocks look like initially like what was day one two three four like what was the amount like overlap how different were they just curious because like for for myself when i started i identified jiu-jitsu in very much the same ways you did where it was like the stances relative to the guard hey standing versus kneeling mm-hmm. all that stuff but how did you combine it into like seven consecutive practices and what did it what did you start with? Maybe what it looked like? I'm just saying. So I didn't have like a, a set order for the practices. I would base it on who was there. So I had just a small group, like maybe 10 to 12 people that were training with me at that time. So I could keep track in my mind. Okay, who was here? What was the last practice they did? So I could make sure that nobody did consecutive practices. Now, maybe it's like, uh, so I would maybe start them with a standing player and somebody that's belly up. And we would start in like with a hip attachment, so a leg entanglement of some sort. And their task might be to put the top player's hips on the mat. The top player was to just break all connections. And then I could, uh, I might go to like, okay, now their hips are on the mat. You have an entanglement. Your job is to keep the hip entangled at all times. Defending player, your task is to break all connections. As you work to break all connections, keep your heel pointed at the attacking player's body. 
And we we started with like long rounds. Like I say long. They were long for us at the time. Seven, eight minute rounds up to ten minute rounds. And so I would just sort of advance and play little variations on like on those situations. So now maybe uh the attacking player is still trying to attack. Defending player, you have an option to counterattack, right? So it could be something as simple as that. That was how I started with it. So that would be like a leg entanglement practice. Maybe the next day we do chest to back. I would start with someone uh, on all fours. The other person, chest to back behind the elbows. First task, top player, put their hips on the mat as many times as you can. Try to keep their hips on the mat. Bottom player, uh, try to remain in an all fours position. If they break you down to your hips, try to get back to your base in whatever way you can. Um, and then I would like advance to like, okay, now top player, your task is to get your hands in between their arms and legs in some way. Bottom player, remain based and try to get the hands outside of your uh, inside positioning or something like that. And then I would go all the way to like, okay, let's get a hook in once we break them down, um, all the way to submission. And I would have just variations like maybe the bottom player now has to turn and face. Um, so I would just kind of do it like that. I don't know if I've answered your question, but... uh No, yeah. absolutely. Josh, I'm curious. All your practices at this time, they sound like they had a central, like one theme per session. Hey, this is all about you know, mm -hmm. chest to back. This is all about entangling mm -hmm. from the guard. Or do you, was that the theme or you just had, what, how many things were you trying to cover in a second? Um, yeah. So it would be in that, it was kind of all over the place when I first started. Generally a theme would be like, uh, for leg entanglements, let's, uh, put their hips on the mat and get the heel pointed away from our body. And it would be variations on that, uh, for the chest to back sort of connection, it would be mostly on putting their hips down and keeping their hips down. But it wasn't, it's, so I'm trying to remember what it was like for me to do this two years ago. Um, so it's hard for me to know if I'm filtering this through the way I think about it now too. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so, totally. Yeah, revisionist history. Is that playing here, right here? Sure. <laughs> uh, in those sessions, though, um, like did you try and play the whole game every practice nope. out the jump, or just one deep one dive deep dive situation. And now, now, what's that look like for you? Are you still sort of deep diving, or have you moved to sort of more like covering? Oh yeah. Areas? So now, I uh, I've sort of narrowed it down, not narrowed it down, and I didn't do this. This is from like talking with Greg, um, but like in jujitsu, like the only thing that ever really happens is we're fighting to access each each person's center, right? Hips, chest, shoulders, and back. We use those connections to make them not move. Um, or on bottom, we use those connections to put them on their back, and then we make them not move. And then we either submit on the limbs through breaking or strangulation. So I'll take one central idea and try to thread it through all of the scenarios, standing, guarded, pinned. Um, so that might be something like, okay, we want to fight for positioning between the elbows or outside of the elbows. I uh, can start with the hand fighting situation. And then the next situation, we might go down to a half guarded situation where you have to fight between or behind the elbows. The win condition is to connect your hands around the other player's torso. Both players are fighting for that condition. Then maybe we go to the mount, and it's the same thing. I need to get my positioning between their elbows and get my hands to the top player's hips. Top player, you want to get between and under the elbows and put them to the head. All right. And so I'll take these themes and I'll thread it all the way through. It might be a specific connection that I'm trying to explore, and we'll thread that through everything as well. So uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, head and arm stuff. Uh, so creating the arm in, arm out scenario with our arms or with our legs, being able to maintain that scenario, being able to use that scenario to either advance positioning or to submit. And so that could be something like a hand fighting position where we're trying to pull the other person's head below ours to make it grabbable. Win condition is if I can connect my hands around the head and arm. Then maybe we go to seated versus standing. 
uh, top players to looking to make a head and arm connection. And then we can even use that connection to submish, su submish, finish with a head and arm strangle or use that to go get chest to back. So we use it to submit or to advance position. And then we can do it from the mount as well. You know, you start with a single underhook, put the elbow to the head, create the arm in, arm out scenario, things like that. Sessions, like how, what have you settled on? Are you running hour sessions, 90 minutes? Do you have mm -hmm. different levels of sessions? Because you're a, a young mm -hmm. school, you know what I mean? So I'll just be curious, how are you just structure? We do an hour and 15 minutes. We do about 45 minutes of different scenarios, and then we try to do about 30 minutes of rolling. Rolling is this open from the feet, tail mm -hmm. sub type stuff, or do you try and guide their practice there in any way? Or that's just the yeah, practice. I just turn them loose. Yeah. yeah. Or what's um, what's sort of the experience level of your school? Was everyone that started with you pretty novice, or did you end up having like a mixed room? I have white to purple right now. So a few have been with me for the entire two and a half years. Uh, and some of those people had maybe a year of prior training experience. Some of the people were brand new. Um, I've had a few people join me from other schools throughout the process. They came in as blue belts. Uh, I had one come in as a purple, two come in as a purple. Um, so we have a pretty good mixture. And people catch on pretty quickly, you know, within a, a month or two, they're able to sort of play the full game in the open roles and they quit like <laughs> stopping and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, we get past that phrase in the, that phase in a couple months. So that's kind of where my skill level is. So are all your sessions like an all levels type practice for the time being? Yes. The, uh, now I can modify that based on who shows up that day. We have uh, close to 40 students at our gym. Um, some practices will have 16 to 18 people. Sometimes we have four, uh, you know, so there's a wide range of attendance levels. And then, you know, sometimes we'll have 12 people show up and they'll all be like good. So in those times, I ramp up the variability, but I still keep the, the common thread running through it. Does that make sense? So I kind of tailor it to who's in the room that day in terms of how complex or how simple the scenarios are. Because I've been talking with a lot of coaches and it's very interesting. Some people really have like every game or drill, whatever you want to call it, like planned before mm -hmm. they come to the session. Um, me and a couple others, you know, I'll have like a couple key games I'll play that are like my jump off points. And then I, you know, vary based on the room. Where do you fall, sir, on that? Because I know obviously you're responsible mm -hmm. like who's in the room, but like you'd like to go in there and know like I'm gonna have exactly three games on this, you know, like how, how particular? I'm I'm not particular. I do come in with the plan sometimes. Uh, sometimes I don't. Uh, so I kind of vary it up as well. There was a three week period where I constrained myself to where I can only set the first two situations. I think it sounds like what you do with the diagnostic games. And I would have to base everything off of what happened in the, the first game and the second game. And so we build off of what I'm seeing in the room. And I could not, I constrained myself to no feedback. I had to design the game so that they would address things and I couldn't use my words to do it. So I felt like that helped me really start designing things very well. And it made me really think about the language I was using as I was explaining the situations. But I don't think that was the way to go, you know, long term. I do think I can give some concurrent feedback that helps people improve uh, at a better rate. But, but that was very useful to me. So, so I've done that. But for the most part, I tentatively plan out about a three-week idea. Okay, we're working head and arm connections, and we're going to kind of progress in this direction so like we first started like creating head and arm from the front head situation and using that as a means to like ground an opponent using that as a means to advance position then we kind of moved into using it to uh, submit as well to create arm and strangles and then i started pairing uh pairing that with like arm and strangles with the legs and then i've gotten to a point now that i've built those basic skills up that I kind of allow all three as win conditions within a scenario that we'll do.
man, the constraining yourself to, because like, you know, it's very easy. And I know this is like a, a challenge for some people. So you really just want to like point out the thing that everyone needs to do and you know, like solve their problems. But you, you really, that, I, you're the only person I've heard of who's like ch- constraining themselves to not give the verbal feedback and instead adjust the constraints or change that. How effective was that? I mean, for you, it sounds like it was a coach development practice, you know, trying to level up your ability to like design whatnot, but like, what, what was that experience like? It was it challenging or. Yeah, it's very challenging. I found it most challenging with newer people. Newer people seem to pull my attention and I, I have the urge to give a lot of concurrent feedback while they're rolling. And so it was very, ch- and I slipped up a couple times. I'm not going to say like I was perfect with this. I would say something before I even realized it. But what it, it was effective for the team. They still got better. Um, but I think long term, it's going to be better for the team because it helped me get very clear with the language I would use. So one of the ideas that I came to through that was not to use any words that require a translation. No guard pass, I will, I never say that. I don't say it at all. Because you have to explain what that means if somebody comes in and doesn't know. Same thing with, uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, posture is one. I, I think y'all were talking about that. I, don't, I won't use that word. Um, anything that requires some sort of explanation as to what I mean, I won't use it. So, um, like... What determines whether somebody's in front or behind somebody? It's elbow positioning. So I can get very clear about what I mean um, and give it to them in a way that they can perceive. Right. So I'm pointing the attention in that way. And so I think clearing up my language through these constraints helped me better focus their attention. Yeah. I mean, and that's a everyone sort of realizes when you really start diving into this is how much more important your language is than ever. Because before you could really you could be in imprecise with your language because you just like, keep the words coming, right? You could keep being prescriptive or really just, you know, you'd point, point it, say it, you know, whereas now you have to be a lot more thoughtful. Um, what's your feedback cycle look like now in your room? Because obviously you remove the constraint mm-hmm. off yourself, really challenging yourself to develop those skills. But like now, what does that look like? Do you give feedback only when they're playing in between session, in between rounds of games, or how do you like to deliver that feedback to your students? I'll give feedback while they're going. Sometimes, sometimes I let it play out. It depends on what I think that I'm seeing in the round. So if it looks like they're focused and they're trying to accomplish the task that I've given them, then I usually don't say anything. But if it feels like or it seems to me like their focus has drifted, I'll sort of redirect with a task, right? Maybe I reiterate the task that I gave them. Maybe I reframe it for them. So I put it in different words for them. So that's one way. I can also remind them of an additional task that will help them along this way. Things like reminding them about the importance of double inside foot position. So I might just say, you know, as you work towards this, maybe you can look at working towards double inside foot position and trying to maintain that as you work. So maybe I give them additional focus. I can also, uh, sometimes I change the constraints mid-round for certain people. Um, If there's a big mismatch in uh, skill level, I can tell uh, the person who's more skilled, like, okay, now you have to satisfy this additional condition before you can win. So things like that, or I can even simplify it if I need to the other way. That So that's my sort of while it's happening feedback. And then I'll give some feedback mid-round. Usually I'm thinking about, I'm already thinking about how I'm explaining this next situation. And if I, I'm kind of going over it in my head uh, to make sure I get the language right. But sometimes people ask me a question and I try to lead with uh, questioning. You know, what did you notice? What were you trying? That sort of thing. But I don't give too much feedback between rounds. Yeah. Do you tend to like, do you like to play multiple rounds of the same game? Or do you like to just say, we're going to have one game really focus on this task and we move on to the next one? So I know like Greg, he really favors multiple games that are different in task focus. Whereas myself, I find 
I, you know, the room really responds well to the same game, but maybe with different partners or maybe just, you know, me refocusing their attention on different, like, you know, my ability to address the room with their attention or an intention type stuff. Where do you fall on that? Let's move on to the next one. But I have done, you know, we'll repeat a situation, um, but I'll give them an additional focus. Um, I would really do that when I was constraining myself to no feedback. So if I'd give a situation and something would pop up, um, I would have them run the same situation, but I would highlight a particular place I wanted them to focus. So it sounds like kind of what you might do sometimes. But yeah, I'll do, I will repeat the situation, but not generally. Generally, I just kind of move along. Um, and the reason I do that is because, and this is part of my growth as a coach, is I'm trying to become more comfortable with like, imperfection and messiness in the room because I've seen it enough now after about three weeks, four weeks, that stuff works itself out. And I find that for me specifically, I'm not speaking about anybody else who repeats game, just me. I do that out of insecurity. I feel like I'm not coaching them well enough. I need to coach them better. And so let's repeat it until we get it perfect. It's that it's from the old model. This is the way that we move. That's sort of beaten into me. Um, so I try not to repeat because I understand that messiness is a part of it. And the reason that I would repeat is to satisfy my own sort of insecurity and not necessarily doing it out of the student's best interest. That's super interesting because that was like for, for myself, I've never had that thought about like the, the drive to repeat it. For me, usually it's to, because also like, I'll switch partners a lot throughout a session. Where where do you do you switch partners a lot? No, I don't. I don't switch partners, but I like it. <laughs> um, I don't switch partners out of force of habit. This is just w the way I started and the model that I fell into. Um, but but I have I do like switching partners um, sometimes. And if I do that, I think it's okay to stay with the same situation because it's a it's a different task in a sense. Because I, I view the the opponent not necessarily a part of the environment, but as a part of the task. And so task does change, and then we have that variation in it. So so I think you can repeat the same situations with different partners, and you don't lose any of that novelty, and you still have variability in that. So you're in your sessions mostly same partners mm -hmm. of the whole session. Uh, do, you, do you care if people are always with the same people like throughout the week? Or is that not really a major concern for you? I would like to have people switch partners. I don't want them with the same partner consecutively. But sometimes I feel like that's better. We have a smaller room right now. Like the biggest class I've ever had is probably 18 or 20. So what that means is sometimes it might be like two of my purple belts that weigh 180. The other guy weighs 200 pounds. And then I've got uh, my 120 pound girl and then 135 pound blue belt. I'm going to put the two purple belts together again in that situation, you know? So again, I think it comes, I'm sort of constrained by the numbers in my room there. I don't have the full luxury of switching every day. Do you uh, choose people's partners? Or do you I let them self-select most of the time. Sometimes I'd be like, Hey, Caleb, go with Logan, you know, something like that. Specifically, like if they have something coming up and I think they would be a good preparation for that, or if this person has a particular uh, difficulty with a skill set, I might put a guy with that skill set together. So sometimes I do match them to give them a particular challenge, but for the most part, they self-select. Right. I would be interested. I know you really took charge of like your own coach educated mm -hmm. for yourself right because you really dove in i know you did some work with like greg but also it sounds like you've been like reading and researching and like you know and of course you're you're implementing in the room and seeing mm -hmm. what's happening and stuff what would your sort of like game plan for getting up to speed or implementing look like if you had to like talk to yourself like two years ago you're like yo this is <laughs> this is some stuff you need to know or approach or so what, what would you consider? Ooh. I mean, I like the way that I did it. Um, I started with uh, the Rob Gray books. That's so easily, uh, it's very approachable. So I really liked that. I think 
the idea of, uh, okay, here's an idea that I've really taken to that I think would have been better if I started, started it earlier. There's a, the baseball study, Rob Gray references a lot, where people are hitting um, off a pitching machine. Um, or it's not a baseball study, it's an idea about specifying information. So to if you're hitting off a pitching machine to learn how to hit a baseball, and the pitching machine throws one speed the entire time, you learn what an 80 mile an hour pitch looks like. But you don't necessarily know what an 85 mile an hour pitch looks like or in 78, right? Throwing that variability in there. So one pitch is 80, the next pitch is 85, the next one 82, gets you to key into the specifying information. So with that in mind, applying that to jujitsu is the idea that I've landed on with the common theme threading it through a bunch of different positions. So I applied variability to a particular idea, a particular connection. And through that, they start to really understand the relationship between that connection and the effect that they're trying to have. So having more of a theme that runs throughout all of the variable, variable positions, I think would be one thing that I would say to myself back then. But outside of that idea, I liked the way that I did it because honestly, I got in with Greg pretty quick into it. I did his coaches group and uh, you, you can't get much better than that, you know, learning from Greg as far as this stuff goes. So I had a pretty good like mentor throughout this. What were some of your main takeaways from like that structured coaching group type experience? I think most people just haven't done like any mm -hmm. coach development type stuff, let alone something that is more um, like direct mentorship type stuff. What would you say were some of your big takeaways from that, that maybe you feel like you wouldn't have come to on your own or would have just taken you way more mm. trial and error? A lot of it was understanding jujitsu better, just understanding the invariance and uh, how these invariants sort of are expressed, I guess, in different positions. So in the coaching group, he basically gave us a 12 week foundations program and we would run that. We would talk to him about it, but through those situations and through talking to him, I was able to start seeing, okay, this is the same thing happening in a seated position versus a kneeling position as it is seating versus standing. Like the same things are happening. So I was able to start seeing that in uh, just a more clear sense. That was the, the biggest thing for me. Yeah, it, that's so interesting because everyone I talked to who really dove into like sort of this method, they had to start rethinking jujitsu because so much of it was autopilot or mm -hmm. subconscious or just never brought to their attention. And by the time, you know, for a lot of these people, they were already like fairly experienced. So they're so far removed from when everything was mm -hmm. novel and new that like, Ah, I didn't realize I like I'm doing this. Yeah, do you have like a new look on grappling as a whole, or just the way you communicate it? Like, what's changed for you there? Because for me, I know the way I grapple is way different now. Not way different, but I feel I feel both less precise mm -hmm. and more precise. You know, less precise because it's ugly. More precise because I'm yeah. always on task. You know, and I I'm very aware of where like the, the fault point will be in this exchange, you know, like where things will go sideways, where things will also have the biggest upside, you know? And I find that is a major challenge point for a lot of people is their understanding of jujitsu or their ability to express what they know about jujitsu just isn't there because they haven't like, it's, you know, it sounds weird to be like deconstructing because obviously we're not trying to like mm -hmm. break it down, but you sort of have to go through that process and it's way easier, of course, if you have someone who can share their vision of Shih Tzu, because then you can sort of like, ah, they have a framework and I can see what's, you know, working in their framework and why mm -hmm. they think of it in this way. And you have like your own new sort of like, yeah, that, that part is just so hard. I don't know if you would have any advice for someone on how they could accelerate that part, because I think it's a big, it's a really big component of being proficient and being able to coach is like this whole new level mm -hmm. of understanding. Yeah, to me, it's two things. So watching 
matches and looking for the things that happen in every exchange. So you just have to watch matches and look for that. Uh, so for me, like here's one of the things that I came to that I've kind of, ah, that wasn't quite right, but it was close. Uh, so I'd watch matches of people playing a lot of leg entanglements. I'd be like, oh, it's all about the front of the hip. They're always covering the front of the hip. And that's true. Um, but I think you can do better than that. They're basically uh, immobilizing the hip. And you try to wedge the hip on all sides. Um, so it's not just the front of the hip. But I kind of saw that. And that was like a, a gateway drug to the actual invariant of like uh, immobilizing the hip. So, so just watch matches for what always happens and what always occurs, no matter what the, the method that they're using is. That would be step one. Step two, I don't know that you have to do this, but for me, finding somebody that could help guide me through this was uh, immensely helpful. I, I feel I would estimate it accelerated my coaching development three to four years, if not more. Do you think that's more so just because you're able to cut out all like the extraneous stuff, you know, and you really got down to like the, the core yes. of it much sooner or was it about like the language? Oh, it's, it's more the first part, more getting to the core of it, but there was an obvious impact on the language that I was using. So I could give them things that they could anchor their perception on. And if you're not thinking about perception, when you're training, which I don't think, I know I certainly wasn't before this, and I don't think most coaches have any sort of understanding of perception, then then you're going to be less effective as a coach. That's the way that I think about it. You have to understand perception and action, or at least have some theory about it. That way you can create uh, a practice that's well-informed. If notes guide to understanding perception a little bit better. Um, it's just the idea of direct perception. And so, so first of all, perception means action. Action means perception. They're the same thing. They make a circle and they feed into each other. You can't separate them. So when we talk about perception, we're also talking about action. So when we say like direct perception, that means that the, the information, so that would be the central sensory information. So what things look like, feel like smell like that wouldn't have a lot of relevance here but um these are the things that we couple our movement to and we move based on the information in our environment so if that's how we operate in the world our training has to have the information in the environment that's why we don't drill that's why we do all live work um you have to have the perceptual information there and that's in the form of the other person's resistance so that would be my my sort of basic idea perception and action are inseparable we operate based on direct perception that means we take the information specific directly from our environment we don't have to enrich it we don't have to change it through mental operations and then we couple our movement to that now I i'm always curious do you ever like this type of stuff to your students or do you just let them run with whatever you're designing and like perception action doesn't really matter affordance not doesn't matter but like you're right. not talking about affordances and you're not like where do you fall on that because like my students have never heard me say anything about the coaching science unless they find me on the internet talking about coaching with other coaches you know? i'm the same way I, I don't i'll never say the word affordance or direct perception or self-organization or anything like that but i have there's a most of the people in my school understand that, that I coach in this way and that it's different than everybody around me. And so they're interested in it. So we do talk about it, but it's not part of practice. Do you run all your sessions yeah. at your school right now? Or do you have any coaching staff? That you nah, I'm, I'm the only one. I had one guy. He was sort of my right-hand man, and he would coach one practice a week. But uh, he had a baby, and so now he's on paternity leave. You know, you talked about these, like, two or three or three week blocks that you like to run with like mm -hmm. one common theme like in that three week block are we going to be touching on a lot of the same task-based games in terms of like what we're doing or how much like you know like because in, in the beginning when you're talking about your starting coaching journey 
you know, you'd have like a similar plan. You would run it in a rotation through a week or through a seven day for your two, your three week block. Are you doing something similar? Like you have, man, these are maybe the, you know, six, seven things like games that I really want to focus on. Let's try and get a lot of touch on that. Or is a lot of that, a lot of that time period very different in terms of what we're focusing on from week to week or session to session within your block idea? Um, not very different, but not the same. Um, so I'll introduce slight variations on either the attentional focus or the win conditions. So the task we're trying to achieve, um, I'll ha we'll have a lot of the same starting positions, but then within that, like maybe, uh, we start a person's on all fours. The other person has front head and arm. Uh, maybe their task is to just keep the partner's hands, elbows, or shoulders on the mat for as long as they can and maintain the head and arm connection. Maybe the next time we do that, you start in that same position. Your task is to use any part of your body to push their elbow towards the center and get behind the elbow and cover their hips. Right? Or then maybe um, it's like use your head and arm connection to put their hips on the mat. You know, So I'll introduce slight variations in the task or the attentional focus, uh, but we'll stay in the same position for a few days. And then I'll advance it and make it more complex. Like maybe I'll add the finishing piece to that at some point, or maybe I'll start with the finishing piece or, and then I'll take it a step further. Like I was saying, like now we have the head and arm with the arms. You can also create the arm in arm out situation with your legs. And so we'll focus there. And then I might bring in ideas about segmentation which threads from the feet. So the feet, it's between or behind the elbows to create shoulder attachment or get to the hips. We might start in closed guard and it's the same thing. I'm trying to create a shoulder attachment through my underhook, my overhook, my cross side underhook, my cross side overhook. And we might use that to start creating the arm in arm out situation. So I have several ideas that are sort of intersecting at all times. Question for you, just because I know I've seen people ask, like start in the same position and you talk about sometimes it's like a task variation, but other times it's just the intentional focus that you're mm -hmm. changing for them, right? I know for me sometimes I'm like, ah, when I'm changing the task, you know, that naturally lends itself to changing where their attention falls. But what would be a situation where like your task is the same, let's say, but you change their attentional focus? What might that look like? Just um, okay, so staying with the... Uh... Front positioning, the head and arm connection, uh, we're looking to go cover their hips, right? To get behind somebody, we have to get behind their elbow. So to do that, we can move the elbow towards the center, or we can start looking at the role of extension, right? So I can change focus there, something like that. Like we're trying to create extension, we're trying to create contraction. Um, it could be something like that. Um, maybe... Uh, I know that's a good one. It could also be with like pieces of the finishing mechanics. So for like a front head strangle with the arm in, we want to get the elbow across somehow. We want to lock and I'll show them what a lock means, you know, hand to hand, maybe it's hand to bicep. There's a different sort of task focus we could change, but we have a lock either on the neck or in the armpit. And then we want to make it use our legs to make sure that their hips can't move. I can kind of show them what that means. So maybe sometimes I won't mention all of the pieces of the finishing mechanics there. So maybe uh, we really focus on um, immobilization of the hips. Maybe we really focus on moving the elbow to the center. Sometimes I'll give them all three, but I try to make sure that I give that in a way where they don't see it as a step-by-step -step process. You know, and usually I'll do that. I'll just say, here are the three things we need. You can achieve these in any order. Um, so, so that would be an example of the different attentional focuses I might give somebody. Man, that's awesome because, you know, lots of times, but one of the biggest hurdles I think is like, man, I need to have 3,000 games if I'm going to develop a sick grappler. But really, it's understanding things like that, where I can have the same sort of game, general same starting position, same win conditions, but how can I get way more mileage out of it, right? Just understanding this little, like, change. Okay, we're mostly 
pulling their attention over here, but we're still trying to get behind mm-hmm. the elbows, cover the hips. That's all we're trying to do. But hey, this is sort of uh, the thought process. That was sick for sharing because, like, you know, I do that, and I think like a lot of people do it, but then they think that they have to change everything that surrounds it. Like the outcome of this task mm-hmm. game is different now too because we're focusing on this thing. Let's say so. That's a really great nugget because it's just not simple. Everyone think about that because. I know when I started really planning, I had so many different things that I thought they should pay attention to. Like, hey, we're playing a sweeping thing. Hey, we could be focusing on our connection. We could be focusing on where their weight is from heel to toe. We could be focused on changing their stance. Like, there's so many things. And that's sort of why, like, for me now, when I play the subsequent games of the same game, every time I'm just dropping a different intentional focus, but also a new partner or the same partner you know that's just such a way to get yeah. way more mileage out of like a well-constructed mm-hmm. activity yeah i think the thing is is like we can think that like we have to be creating a lot of not novel situations but a, a, a bunch of different games and really so much can happen from the same thing it's just like weird example but oftentimes i think like when i'm thinking of my jiu-jitsu stuff it's sort of like programming like a, a starting strength workout for someone you know we have like squat push pull and we can talk about different things in the squat and you can get better at your squat and we can just be doing that same core activity same thing yeah for your, you know it's i always think it's weird mm-hmm. but it's very similar you know if you want to think of it as simple in programming terms like that if we did three same areas every session for a while and I, this is an experiment i haven't ran yet i sort of want to at some point just run like 40 days of the same three or four games, but change my attention and focus for the guys every time and see what happens. That's sort of like my vision for like a beginner block, but I, I just run all levels still. So I haven't done it, but yeah, I think like that's a great way to get mileage out of a couple of really Mm well-crafted scenarios and share all the stuff you sort of want to share, you know, because that's another thing too is like we want to share because that's sort of something that drew us to coaching at some point. It's like, ah, I know it can help you have an aha moment, but now we have to design the thing that helps you have that mm-hmm. aha moment, you know, and sort of take it and own it yourself. That was good. I, I like that. This is a great way to spell it out. Yeah. And what you were talking about, you know, a million different games and they need to be all this stuff. There aren't that many things that really happen in jiu-jitsu, you know, one of the ideas, uh, and one of the things that I've come to realize is that jujitsu is far simpler than I used to make it out to be. There's only a few things happening, but they're happening everywhere all at once. So, so you don't need a bunch of different situations. You need to hit a few different alignments and then let people work. And, and I'm very much with you. Like jujitsu simple, it's not easy, but it's not easy because mm-hmm. you can get distracted, right? You can lose sight of what is most important here. That tends to be a lot of what I try to do for like my athletes. It's like, man, what is most important here? And I always use an example like this black belt and the blue belt. One is just on task way more often yeah. than the blue belt. And that's all that because, man, you already know a lot of the stuff by blue belt. You've already seen the, the most common ways to really effectively get past someone's mm-hmm. legs. And, and I'm just always on task, you know, not always. Yeah. I wish. But, you know, like, you know, that, that's such an important thing where I feel like it's not it's it's just so simple but it's hard to it's hard to i think especially when you came up like the old school way of being okay mm-hmm. with it being that simple because you came up with like needing a move for a move and there's so many little situations where it's like the more and more i think of it as like a sport which it is more mm-hmm. and more becoming now you know um man sports are they try and do a thing. I reset to where I want to go when I start mm-hmm. to pose myself. You know, it's not like I let them do this thing to me. And while they're doing this thing to me, I'll do this yeah. count. You know, that doesn't happen mm-hmm. in like sport, you know, which is what we're doing. I think part of that is like just the way martial arts like in North America sort of was. and other There's, there's, there's a whole rant I could get into there. But it's cool to hear that you're on a similar thing because it's that can be challenging for people. To be like, oh, am I covering enough? Like probably. You know, chances are you're, if anything, you'll end up trying to cover too much and like diluting how effective you can be mm-hmm. and actually helping people. Because the thing I've come to realize is like people just want to be good enough to be able to play on their own and know why they suck and know mm-hmm. why they do good sometimes. They don't really want to 
know every in and out. They just want to be able to mm-hmm. run with it. You know, and that's more so my thing. Like, I used to have a big sort of hang up on like, man, I'm not really covering this particular set of connections that I used to. Like early on, I used to really cover like particular scenarios. Hey, we're already starting here. I got like a lower leg shift and a half guard. We have a type, like I was like, like very like, oh, I want to make sure they get lots yeah. of touches here. And more and more now I find like, I don't do that so much is I just always am trying to get them focused on just the couple core ideas that happen in mm-hmm. every exchange. You know, for me, like, I'm sure you've developed your own like four or five things that are just true in every situation that you want to talk about with people, you know, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's one thing I find really interesting is people get really effective at communicating their lens to their students. Cause like for me, I just have a couple of things I talk to, Hey, the quality of your connection, the angle height, you know, and then attacking or maintaining stance. Like in most positions, these things are all I really care about what it looks like totally different if I'm playing guard mm-hmm. or if I'm passing or if I'm, submitting but it's the same couple of things we're always thinking of you know uh, yeah i don't know where i was going with that but i'm sure you've had like a similar thing like ah i'm really distilling it down to just a couple right. of things that matter at all times you know what what would you say are a couple of things that you sort of distilled it down to it's uh getting past the limbs to get to their center and then working back out to the limbs once you've immobilized their center um and then it's not as linear as that you know like it's all at once and then there's like give and take and ebb and flow. So it's not like a step by step thing, but that's kind of the idea. Um, I, I take Greg's um, conceptualization, you know, immobilization as it leads to breaking and strangling. I take that. Very, I think that's it. Um, and then we have to be able to make connections for those purposes of uh, managing distance and then. You know, we've got like segmentation, isolation, immobilization, all those things. I take that very seriously. And I think it's, I think he's pretty much got it down. He put it in his latest YouTube video. If anybody wants to go watch that, um, that pretty much describes the way I see jujitsu too. Yeah. And it's like such a simple framework that you can explain to anyone like, man, their, their arms, legs, and head are your first Mm -hmm obstacle because we've got to get to their body because we can't hold them still until we get there yeah. everyone's like oh got it you know and i find like if they're having trouble in a standing scenario i'm like bro remember this core idea gotta mm-hmm. do these limbs first and in a guarded scenario you know you can talk very much about those things and i find the more you can do that now your students have connected the dots they have better questions yeah. better understanding too you know just mm-hmm. how and playing. the first task of a coach is yeah. to for the beginning player just to get them able to play. And, and I think having a very simple, direct explanation like that can get them playing very quickly. When I see the trial guy already doing good mm-hmm. in the wrestling games because they got the basic idea or the guard game, like, man, this is literally your first day. You're going to be dead yeah. and exhausted, but like, you yeah. know what you're trying to do, right? It's like, I say this in like everything. My goal is for it to eventually be as easy as pick up mm-hmm. with basketball. You just roll in. Like, yeah, I can play this. You know, like it should see that simple because like people don't get all strung out about going to do mm-hmm. like yoga or going to like play like, you know, like some it should be that accessible. And I think a lot of that is lost in the sauce of how mm-hmm. we coach and whatever. But I have a question. Um, you know, earlier you talked about and I'm mm-hmm. jumping all the way back. You talked about not wanting to use phrases that have to be unpacked mm-hmm. you know like hey posture or passing the guard does that also apply to things like tools that you use like you know uh, inside bicep tie or a cross face or you know cro- like do you use that type of language that you know it is or not or where do you fall on sort of the name you know? no i try to make everything is uh with direct language so i'll say um I guess double inside foot position is something that maybe needs unpacked, but it's still, um, and when I say that, I mean, get your feet between their knees. Um, so I'll say double inside foot position, but whenever I explain situations, I'll say, all right, the win condition is when I can get both feet between their knees and hook onto their legs. Um, or get under their elbows or put my chest behind their elbows. So I try to make it as direct language as possible. 
So I try to be an absolutist with that. I fail at some point just because I think that's the human, it's our nature. But yeah, I, I try to be an absolutist there. Of course, try that too. And But sometimes like, ah, do I need to give them the language that people use so they can independently study and expand mm -hmm. their game? Because I know in my room, I'm covering the core of grappling and not all the stuff that's on the periphery, right? Like not the deep dives of whatever mm -hmm. or... And that's something that like I, I go back and forth with. Like, should I tell them some of the more particular language that people will use if they mm -hmm. want to dive into it? Or do I stay focused on the main thing here? What's your sort of thought? Um, I don't think that needs to come from me. So I watch people talk between rounds, during rounds, and they'll use language like that. Like, I've got a Kimura, right? I don't call it that. I call it like a double wrist lock. Uh, that helps people make the connection better. Because if you ever try to teach a brand new person uh, the Kimura grip, they're all over the place, right? But double wrist lock, you know, there's two wrists being grabbed. It helps them anchor onto that. But that, when they talk amongst themselves, they'll talk about, like, uh, the saddle position or, you know, things like that. But I don't talk about it that way. So I think it takes care of itself. Nice. Interesting. Yeah, because that's always something like, ah, do I have to or should I? Not a have to because you don't have to shit. But should I? Like, will that help them be a better, like, student on their own or not and it's interesting for you and i think even for me I, it probably is just sorting itself out because they are scrolling on youtube and instagram or whatever and they're already seeing things be called things like oh we've done that yeah. it is this you know i guess that connection is really interesting what else is going on in your room what's something you've been doing in your room recently that you're really happy with that has just been working all right so the well the, the examples that i've given a lot today that's what we've been focused on uh, we did a, a tournament in, on February the 4th, and uh, we lost five matches, um, all because of in front head situations. When we were on the defending end of that, we would stay on our knees. And so we were immobile. They would either choke us and we wouldn't move, or they would go behind us and cover our hips and then start taking our back. We only lost like seven matches out of a whole lot that day and five of them were for that reason so that was what kind of informed our practices over the next several weeks and since then we had um one of my uh purple belt women she competed uh just on saturday at uh, an event in fort worth texas and i'd seen her compete a lot right she fights mma i've watched all her fights I've seen her in practice. She never had a penchant for attacking any sort of front head strangles with the arm in. And she put it into competition after like three weeks of working on different arm in scenarios. Um, she didn't get the finish, but she controlled the match. She put that girl's hips down. She was able to get to a, a pinning position off of it. Like she dominated this girl. And a big part of that was this brand new thing that we had put into practice that she translated into the real world. So seeing that translation was something that, that I was very proud of because to me, that means that practice was effective. So that's obviously something I like. And then I like the, we have a very good culture in our room. I don't know exactly how that happened. You know, it's not like something I set out trying to make happen. I did do some intentional things for that, but like everybody, Maybe it's like like-minded people are attracted to each other, but like everybody really like looks out for each other, supports each other, roots for each other, um, helps each other out. It's like the culture has been very great and we train extremely hard. Like it's, it's, it's really hard. You know, I've heard you say a few times, like, uh, one of the benefits of switching to this model is that, uh, people don't worry as much about submissions or getting submitted and things like that. Not in my room. People fight to the death <laughs> and you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, but the only able, the only way that we've been able to sustain that is because everybody looks out for each other so well. So it's not really something that I did, but it is something I'm proud of. If that makes sense. Yeah. The culture of a room, lots of times it's just 
because of activity and playing the game so much, it really makes it feel like just regular mm-hmm. sporting stuff. You know, like you're hanging out, we're playing, we're having fun, we're going hard. Nobody's like yeah. getting hurt, but we're still going hard all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that's a a super important thing. Um, are you? I man, I find most people are like, hey, we have like zero injuries. How do you feel? Those um, well, it's going to depend on how you define injury. So we've had we have one guy, two guys. Three. We've had three what I would call injuries. We had one guy uh, separate his AC joint. Um, we had one guy hurt his shoulder and his hip when he was cutting a lot of weight, so he was seriously depleted. And then we had another guy with a, a knee dislocation. Now, this is over the course of all the two and a half years that we've been training hard. So our like actual injury rate is very low, but people get nicks and bruises and banged up and i'm sore here and i'm sore there you know so like people are like feeling it but as far as injury goes it's pretty low yeah i have like such a similar experience and the things that you described those sound like things of falling body weight gone bad you know in more situations than not which is just like that is just you can't you can't always determine which way yeah. the blows yeah. sometimes you know uh but yeah i find like man I don't worry about people being in locked out subs and like somebody blowing their shit up. So you're definitely going to be applying like, you know, good system breaking force mm-hmm. the whole time and finish it. But I'm like so relieved. I feel like just the, that part is so much healthier. Yeah. If that makes sense. You know, just like the ability for us to go all the way to like the red line and be able to stop mm-hmm. it just before is a super valuable thing for every trainer. Cause I think that's why I, a lot of people can have like attrition in their room or people who like are missing sessions, like very much like you. I only have it if there's falling body weight that went wrong, you know, otherwise we're super safe. And I don't teach any, not anything, but like we don't do break falls or any sort of like movement prep anymore. It's just like setting it up. Man. Well, I was going to say that what, what, how I think about it. Um, Do you have kids? Okay, so I've got a year and a half, a uh, little boy, he's a year and a half years old. And uh, when he's learning to walk and stuff, he has to like fall. Um, you have to let him fall, let him try to walk. And he sort of like through that process under starts to understand like where the danger is, where I'm going to fall harder. And you have to risk him I'm not a neglectful parent, so do not take it this way. But you have to risk him getting banged up a little bit, you know. Sometimes he, he's fallen and hit his head on the ground. Um, he cried. He was okay. But over time, that stopped happening. So I think by going live, you start to learn where the lines are in a way where if you're not going live, you're not going to get that same sort of sensitivity to where danger is and danger isn't. I think that's a, an interesting thing is sometimes coaches can want to like protect their students from like the end range of like a, a scenario, you know, but really that just makes them way less prepared to keep mm-hmm. themselves safe in that exchange, you know, when it actually happens. And like, I'm not, not against the idea of like tap early, tap often, but like if you're tapping as soon as your hands get separated, you will not know how to keep yourself safe when your hands actually get separated and you yeah, don't want to get absolutely. Tapped. You know what I mean? Like there's things like that where like, oh, you have to figure out that, but like healthy culture is a great way to let people get deep, to mm-hmm. deep, deep water and learn from it rather than like, cause I'm sure you, like you've seen people who, like, as soon as their hands get separated, they're tapping like, bro, but don't tap. Like not don't tap, but like, he's not going to break you right now. Like trust your guy. He's not going to break you just like, violently yeah. it's Tuesday night. Yeah. You know, but if you're afraid of that, you'll get broken way more likely by accident than if you're like safe with that little bit of injury. You've known where you can play to. Like, yeah, I find the tendency to want to keep people like in that perfect green zone of safety. You know, maybe the edge to the you know, yellow, but you never let them get deep enough is one of the biggest risks sometimes, which is why I think like the live resistance all the yeah. time is so effective. Like, yeah, sick. Um, 
man, I had one last thing I just wanted to pick your brain on because I always like to know what is your thought process for designing a game or a drill or an activity? Like, what do you think of, or like, what it might be one or two frameworks you sort of use to like design or practice it? Um, so it, it all comes from whatever thread that I'm weaving throughout the whole practice. So I start there. Here's an idea. Here's a connection that I want to develop. And I have to understand that connection within the total framework of immobilization as it leads to breaking and strangling. And the best way to immobilize is to access center mass. So get their hips, chest, and shoulders by beating their, their limbs, getting past their arms and legs. So the connection, how that connection relates to the whole game. And then I'll just try to, okay, does that fit into, how does that fit into a guarded scenario? And then I'll play it there. How does that fit into a pinning scenario? And I'll play it there. Okay, how does that fit into a standing situation? And I'll play it there. So same thing, understand it within the full context, how it relates to that, how it functions underneath that. And then how can it be applied in all of the situations of grappling, standing, Guarded and pinned. Yeah, you do zoom out mm -hmm. and zoom in, which is a skill in itself, right? To be able to find where this thing is a constant everywhere, you know, like the power of a underhook in all these situations. The way we use it, are like, you know, it's an example of like one connection maybe mm -hmm. that you might focus on or a head and arm like you're talking about. And then when it comes to designing like an individual game, so now you have your high level thing and now you're thinking, man, I want to create this task based game. What, what, how do you, yeah, just give me an example of how you might like walk through, like, hey, say we wanted, yeah, just run me through what you might think of as your process there now when you're thinking of one component. Okay, so um, it would be something like I would start with whatever the idea I wanted to emerge would be. So maybe it's like an arm and strangle. Um, okay, so here's an arm and strangle from this position. What what is the resistance to this? Okay. So, so again, it's going to tie back into immobilization. So if I have an all fours opponent and then the, the attacking player has a front head and arm, first thing we have to do is be able to maintain that connection and use it for these different purposes. And so for me, it's like, okay, with this connection, I need to keep them from moving as much as possible. So I'm gonna do that by keeping their hands on the mat. So top player, keep the front head and arm connection and keep their hands on the mat for as long as you can. Bottom player wins if they're on their feet with their head free. So I give the other person the task that would completely remove themselves from the situation. I might give them a constraint or a focus that makes them engage in a way that is more difficult for the attacking player and then um, yeah have the attacking player's task be to um, keep them immobile in some way so it might be something like that I don't know if if it's that clear if that was very clear but that's kind of for that situation that's how I would do it yeah I very much usually have like the same starting point of like not control scheme but sort of you know the fundamentals of that mobilization are keeping or keeping that effect alive as long as possible. It tends to be like a lot of my starting points. And then your next step generally is just... So uh, what you just said actually triggered something. So we have to be able to make a certain connection. We have to be able to maintain it. We have to be able to act on it. All right. So then maybe it's like, uh, maybe I back it up. So, okay, we need to be able to create this situation. Okay. And then depending on the situation that that's in, maybe it's uh, we start front head and arm against an all fours opponent, but our hands aren't connected. So now you have to go connect your hands and keep their hands down. Um, or it might be if we're looking to act off of this, it could be to create the arm in arm out situation. It could be to get behind the elbows and cover the hips. Or if I have more advanced players, I offer multiple win conditions. So that's one of the things I've been doing over the three weeks is trying to build up skills so that I can open the situation up. You know, we talk about this is something I've actually been thinking about. So I'm going to just kind of go into this real quick. We talk about, you know, our role as a coach is to folk 
uh, focus their intention and attention. So our intentions are actually constrained in and of themselves by our current abilities, our dynamics, right? I can imagine things, but that doesn't mean I intend them. So there's a difference there. So this is an example I gave. So let's say we have a day one white belt. And I'm going to use DeAndre Corby because he's my favorite grappler. Grappling with DeAndre Corby. Now that day one white belt may have seen a flying triangle on YouTube. And they can imagine themselves doing that to DeAndre Corby. But they start hand fighting. There's no way they can intend that. Their intentions are constrained by their current organization and their current abilities. Right? So I'm building up these skills in simpler situations over these three weeks. So we're kind of progressing so that they have the ability to intend farther. And if they can do a bunch of different things with this one connection, Maybe it's a front head and arm connection, like I've been saying. I can use that to keep them grounded. I can use that to go get their hips. I can use that to strangle. I can use that to put them on their back. They can start intending on these different things and developing metastability on that intention. Right. So now my intention isn't locked on to one thing. I can flexibly switch it back and forth depending on what's happening, what resistance I'm feeling. But in order to develop that adaptability, I have to have all of these other skills in place. Otherwise, I'm just imagining things. So the like, how do I design games? How do I progress on that? I have this end sort of uh, vision in mind of the ability to do use this one connection for multiple things. And I build towards that throughout the weeks. Because that is true. Uh, imagine, you know, you, 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 but you can't do it. You can't get close to it. So it's not really even within the realm. And yeah, it changes everything. Man, that's a really good insight. I appreciate that. That was a good way to sort of encapsulate that, especially as it relates to your goal of mm -hmm. what is that big outcome. And really, it's just you want them to be competent with this one tool or this one set of connections and know that yeah, I, I, that was i like that a lot i also really like the, the simplicity of like make a connection maintain a connection and then like act on that connection yeah. right that's a a really simple framework that i think like everyone can see and think about like oh very easy for me to do it. like design around just those three sort of lines yeah that was dope man anything else you want to Share. Um, well. Yeah, I want to give uh, a shout out real quick. So I mentioned I went to the my girl competed in Fort Worth last weekend, and I looked on the uh, it's like the Eco for BJJ Dynamics Instagram page. They have like this map with all the different gyms that claim to be Eco. Um, and so I went to one in Fort Worth. It's Vasquez BJJ. Those guys are. Um, they're about it, man. They, uh, I had a really good time. It was the first time I got to do another coach's practice. So that was really cool. Um, and it was cool to see where we converged on a lot of the practice design. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to shout them out because they were super nice. They were super welcoming and they're new schools too. So like I understand kind of how that goes. So yeah, they were great. Um, and I just wanted to thank them publicly for, uh, being so great and doing what they're doing because they're 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 the real deal. Yeah, man, that, it's always uh, really interesting when you get a chance to see what other people up to and like experience and yeah, that's that's cool. I haven't really had too many chances to cruise around and find anyone like it's really trying it yeah. all the way. You know, people will dabble, people will play a game as part of a warm up or some other thing. So it's really interesting when you hop in, like oh these these guys are completely immersed <laughs> and you can see it. But it's also very interesting when you can recognize like the similarities that are happening, not in isolation from each other, because we're all sort of finding some of the same ideas and whatever, just mm -hmm. the way it manifests, seeing that, which is also part of the goal of like chats like this, help you see like, oh, a lot yeah. of people are thinking similar things. And that can build that confidence that you talked about way at the beginning, where you have that lack of confidence mm -hmm. that makes you want to revert, right? Hearing this, I hope, you know, everyone can realize, oh, well, I'm on, I'm, on, I'm, yeah. I'm in the realm. You know, we could keep going. Keep yeah, going. we're all looking at the same thing. So it makes sense that we're going to come to the same understanding over time, you know. 
and we use different words to do it. They used language that, that I don't use, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't spot on. You know what I mean? They were talking about the same thing in their own words. Uh, it was really cool to see. Thanks for sharing that. That's, yeah, it's, I want to check out that eco map and just start. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Man, Josh, I've taken a gang of your time. Hopefully you had fun talking about coaching. I could do this hours on end, no problem. But uh, yeah, man, uh, let's try and do this again sometime. Appreciate it for sure. Maybe like 6, 10, 12 months down the line because just seeing the progression and everyone's thoughts and the way they're communicating and their ideas because you have ideas now that are in their infancy and by then you have a whole, whole yeah. bunch of data to yeah. sort of talk about. Yeah. Sick, man. Um, I was just going to say, and, and by then, like, I won't, it was like me in the beginning trying to remember what I used to do and how I used to think about it. And like, that was, that was really hard. I probably sounded like a, a fool there for a minute because I couldn't remember what was going on back then. <laughs> yep. I mean, that, that's the challenge. So a little bit of documenting our journeys as coaches is. For sure. So again, thanks for just sharing everything, especially you have a really unique setup you know start a brand new school from scratch from scratch you know running it from the day one and having great results having a room that's loving training having a room that can yeah. perform um Thanks. Yeah, you're doing good work i know i know greg speaks highly of you that's what i'm gonna reach out to josh if he's in it in it like this yeah it was a blast man i appreciate you having me on for sure yeah thanks so much